food and uh, the food was what caused its heart disease. Nobody was moving and everyone was completely stressed out. And I actually realized while I was lying there that that is basically the grand challenge that we're faced with. Sleeplessness, 25% of our population, mental health, some in the order of 25-ish percent right now around depression, and anxiety, pretty uh, a little bit higher for things like burnout, um, overweight and obesity, 60-ish percent of the population, physical inactivity, 85% of the population. But despite having seen these data and discovering all of those data, I was actually really excited. And I, I remain incredibly hopeful because the opposite of these, I believe, is a pathway to how our society can unlock human potential, how we can all get healthier, we can all improve our well-being, we can all perform to our potential. And I say this with like open arms and welcoming, doesn't matter where you are, the greatest athletic performance I've ever seen in my entire life, been to three Olympics, was um, a young girl in the cancer ward getting up and walking up and down the hallway by herself. Like that was by better than Usain Bolt, better than Michael Phelps. So I do not care where we are on this spectrum. I just wanna welcome everybody an open invitation and, and love and, and, and hope that we can all just sort of move the needle and slightly elevate our, our well-being. And I encourage you as I go through today's session to drop questions in the Q&A, throw comments into the chat. I am super thrilled to make this a lot more about you than, than about me. But ultimately, this is what we're going to be speaking about today is simple, effective, evidence-based tactics to improve health and well-being with a focus obviously on education and on creating a, a healthy place for us to learn. And I've tried my very, very best to align my comments today to the educational curriculum that Rick shared with me. And although I can't address all of the elements of that curriculum, like financial literacy, not my space, I'm a physiologist, not, a, not an investment professional, there are a number of different areas in which I think I can provide you with some context and additional information to support you as you go through this year so we can all collectively help our students and ourselves, of course, incorporate health and wellness practices into our days, our weeks, our months, and our years. Everything that I'm sharing with you today, I do want you to feel like and use for you because at the end of the day, this is just like an airplane. If it, there's decompression or whatever and the oxygen masks drop, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on other people because if you don't put it on yourself first, you might pass out because of lack of oxygen and then no one gets masks. So in everything that I'm saying today, the objective obviously is for you. How can we do this for you with the hopes then that if someone comes to you and maybe wants some assistance, you can do it for them also, right? Like if you are in a great place and a student is struggling, they come to you and you're in a great place, that interaction has a chance of going well. Whereas if you're both struggling, that interaction will not end up in where we want it to end up. And one of the core pillars of the curriculum that Rick shared with me that I'm so excited about um, interacting with really is this idea of active living. And I'm so fired up because this holds so much potential for us throughout the course of, again, the day, the week, the month, the year. And it doesn't really matter how much you get. Like if you're doing a marathon, that's cool. But the great thing is research from McMaster University in Hamilton and Stu Phillips lab has shown that as little as one minute of physical activity, literally one minute of physical activity throughout the course of the day is enough to improve your health and well-being. And what we've discovered is that any physical activity improves your cardiovascular system. This is an MRI scan. It's me. Actually, you're looking at my insides there. Um, those are my lungs, my heart. We know that when we move our bodies, it doesn't need to be hard, doesn't need to be like long workouts or anything like that. We're just going for a walk. We're stretching, we're moving, we're gardening, we're doing housework. Maybe it's a run and a bike and all those other things, but any type of movement whatsoever, any physical activity whatsoever improves the heart, improves the lungs, increases the number of red blood cells that we have in our bodies. And these are so important because they carry oxygen to our muscles and to our brain. We also get more mitochondria. These are the energy factories in 
the body that break down the foods that we eat in order to create energy for movement, for thinking, for digestion, everything that our body does. Obviously, if we move our bodies, our muscles get better and we move fluids through the lymphatic system. Now, this is the system that fights off colds, it fights off flus, it keeps us healthy, it fights off cancer. It's why we're, your doctor will feel the lymph glands in your neck to see if you're fighting off a cold or the flu. It's why we worry about breast cancer spreading to the lymph nodes in the underarm. This is the system that fights off cancer. The cool thing is when we move our bodies, we pump fluids through the lymphatic system. Now the lymphatic system flows through your body. It's, it's full of a clear fluid called lymph. You've all seen it. If you've ever had a blister and popped that blister, that clear fluid that comes out is lymph. You shouldn't have popped the blister, but if you did, that's lymph. And that flows through your body. It picks up viruses, bacteria, broken down cells, waste products, and pulls those into the lymphatic system where white blood cells from the immune system fight off all those invaders. This is the system that keeps you healthy. It's a system that keeps your body clean. And when we move physically, we will go for a walk. We do some stretching. We do some yoga, housework, whatever it is, lift weights, all the counts, play sports. We help the uh, lymphatic system function and pump fluids through our body, which is so cool. In fact, we know that if we get a little bit of physical activity every week, we reduce our risk for upper respiratory tract infections like colds and flus by about 75%. So it's quite powerful and really, really exciting as well. Um, and by the way, Rick just mentioned that it's showing the full list of slides on the left. I know that I can't fully share my screen because then I can't see my upcoming slides. So Ignore the upcoming slides and just pay attention to the ones that, that I have up there, everyone. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, I'm kind of hacking my way through the technology uh, right now, but I appreciate your patience and support with me regardless. Um, the other really cool thing that we have discovered about physical activity more recently is that when we are physically active, we lengthen and strengthen the telomeres, which are the caps on the end of our DNA that protect our DNA from fraying and breaking apart. Now, they're sort of like, imagine like aglets on the end of a shoelace. When those shorten, the shoelace starts to fray. As we age, the exact same thing happens to our DNA and telomeres serve the same purpose as those aglets on the end of your shoelace. That is what they're called, aglets. I had to look that up. And when we exercise, we lengthen and strengthen our telomeres. In fact, 55-year-old runners have the same telomere length and strength as 25 year olds. So physical activity literally keeps our DNA young, which is kind of cool. The other really interesting thing, again, it's going further, I'm almost done with these ideas and we're gonna get into a little bit more of the workshop side of things, is that when we move our bodies and pump blood through our muscles, our muscles release something called stem cells. Probably heard about these, big research topic lately, very involved in the potential prevention and treatment of many different diseases in the future, but we have access to all of that right now simply through movement. We have a store of stem cells in our muscles and in a bunch of other places too. And when we move our bodies, those stem cells circulate throughout the course of the body and go out and heal, repair, and regenerate our tissues, keeping us healthy. This is such a powerful effect that physical activity actually increases our longevity, how long we live. And you can see that data here, the long, the more physical activity that we get, the lower our risk of all cause mortality, that's something of cancer, heart disease, type of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all wrapped up together. The more movement that we get, the better our outcomes are. But remember, these benefits start at one minute per day. So it doesn't matter where you're at, doesn't matter what's been going on up until this point, every single little bit counts and helps us out tremendously. It's one of the reasons why over the last few years, I have been super focused on keeping my kids. It is Ingrid and Adam. They are now um, 13 and eight. They were a lot younger when this photo was taken, but we've just been working on being physically active as much as we possibly can every single day, ideally outdoors. Uh, and certainly even a lot more on the weekends. And we did that to protect their mental health. We did that to protect their physical health, their emotional health. And it has become a big part of what we do as a family and what I would love for all of us to consider elevating and supporting in our schools. I don't necessarily think we need to have more physical 
at um, education, although I'm a kinesiology grad from U of C and phys ed is awesome and important and really, really helpful for health and academic achievement. But the way I think that we can accomplish this as a team, as a province, as a country, as a planet is by helping people understand the benefits of physical activity, which is general habitual physical activity. And a few years ago, we did a number of studies at SickKids on the exercise for cancer, physical activity and cystic fibrosis, exercise in heart conditions, lupus and inflammatory disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, and across all of these different studies over and over and over again, we found that the exercise interventions helped. They improved outcomes for the disease, they improved outcomes for lifestyle, they improved outcomes for mental health. But as soon as the studies were over, the kids stopped exercising. We were like, well, that doesn't really help us very much. What did, what's the point? And Dr. Jane Schneiderman at SickKids went back and combed through all of the data and found that the children who are the most generally habitually physically active were the ones who had the lowest risk for long-term decline due to their diseases. And so what we have subsequently begun to recommend is that although endurance training is good, strength training is amazing, stretching is fantastic, interval training is awesome, all of it's great, it works. The key for us when it comes to our health and well being is general habitual physical activity, which is walking, gardening, housework, bike rides with the family, you know, go hiking on the weekends, whatever it is, general habitual physical activity. Um, we built in my lab over the last five years now um, an app that oops sorry that an app that allows us to sharing my screen again my apologies an app that allows us to track all sorts of different aspects of our health and wellness it's called Vivio I'll give all of you access to this um, if you do a workout it'll you know as a physiologist I built it to track your heart rate your heart rate recovery the distance that you traveled the watts that you've put out like all of these different things. And I now realize that none of that is anywhere near as important as simply the number of steps that you take throughout the course of the day. And that can be anything. Data is pretty clear that around 7,000 steps a day is the best for minimizing our risk of all cause mortality and a bunch of other conditions. But the reality is that that doesn't really matter. You probably heard 10,000 steps, it's actually probably seven. That, I'm not even remotely concerned about that because all I want is for people to do just a little bit more. So if right now your step count is like 1500, and by the way, if you have an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, a Garmin, Samsung Galaxy Gear, like whatever your, your wearable is, if you have one, they're, they're all tracking the number of steps that you take. And if you have a phone that you keep on your body, that is also tracking the number of steps that you take. So you can check this out. All that I care about is a little bit more that's it so if you're at 2000 you might want to get 2200 if you're at 4000 maybe 4500 if you're at 7000 maybe go to eight if you're at 10,000, pump the brakes you're doing awesome if you're at 20,000, that's a half marathon more than enough maybe go home and talk to your partner or spouse right you're all good you've done it you've made it you're, you're doing fantastic um and so you can check that out. I've had a couple of people ask about the app. So the app is called Vivio. Um, I will just put that into the chat. It's V-I-I-V-I-O. And the website is www.viiv.io. That is now in the chat. You get a month free, message me. I'll give you a link for three months free. It's only four bucks a month. Um, track sleep, eat, move, and think. It gives you 1% tips every single day. Um, so, you know, four months, check it out. If you like it, great. If you don't, no stress, uh, but I'll make sure that I give you the link to go to that at the end of, of today's session. But if you want to download it, I would be infinitely grateful because we have been working really, really hard um, at trying to make that awesome for the people that attend my presentations. But ultimately, when it comes down to all of this is I would love for you to just simply sprinkle physical activity throughout the course of your day. Um, had a fun session with a school in Ottawa, Ontario, and uh, there was 2,000 students in the auditorium as I was doing um, something like this for them. And the teachers all warned me. They were like, do not stop talking. The second that you stop talking, you're going to lose control of the room. 
just plow through your 20 minutes, get it done, and then get out of there because this is a rowdy group. And about 10 minutes into that session, yes, they were being rowdy. They were moving around a little bit. They're, you know, the, the, the noise was going up. I'm sure many of you can identify with that. And I was like, all right, everyone, everyone stand up. And I could see all the teachers just, you know, going like this. And the principal was like, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> so I stopped and I was like, everyone, 20 seconds, shadow boxing, go. And you're all like, ah. In fact, you can just do this with me for 10 seconds because we're all just sitting here doing this anyway. Right, just like, like, uh, I was like, go, keep going, uh, get it out, get it out. And I was like, and all the kids just sat back down and they were quiet. And all of the teachers tilted their heads. <laughs> like, I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> and the principal was like, I guess carry on. It was amazing. What I essentially did was I just leveraged this. So, this is the electrical activity inside the brain of a zebrafish at rest. As soon as you move, in this case, swim, the entire brain lights up. Lots of electrical activity shoots through the brain. And then when you stop moving, the brain settles down again. And the interesting thing is that we're learning that if we alternate physical activity with periods of stillness, it increases our ability to learn and it increases our cognitive performance. This is data from an inner city school in Chicago, highlighted in a book called Spark by Dr. John Ratey. I'll write that into the chat as well in case anyone wants to check it out. It's Spark and it's Dr. John, J-O-H-N-R-A-T-A-Y. Um, he's been on my podcast. So if you search Greg Wells and John Ratey, you'll find it hour long chat, amazing. Anyway, in this study, what they did was they took a group of children and they did nothing, control group. They took a group of kids and they walked them up and down the hallway before math class and a group of kids and they walked them up, excuse me, up and down the stairs before math class. And because you, you can see the results here show that the moderate intensity group improved their outcomes in math and the intense exercise group improved their outcomes even more. These data were supported by MRI scans of the brains of these children in the study, and they found an increased density of neurons in the region of the brain, behind your forehead, right at the frontal lobe of the brain, associated with executive functioning, which is essentially controls your cognition. So not only did their brains change, but their outcomes in mathematics improved as well. This data, the study was replicated in the United Kingdom, 5,000 students, they found for every 15 minutes of physical activity that was added to the school day, GPAs went up a quarter grade point, up to a maximum of one hour, one full grade point beyond which there were no further benefits. So ultimately, that's sort of like the dream. If I could rewrite the way Canada works and say all children in all schools across the entire country must get one hour of physical activity throughout the course day, I'd be like, that's the best. I would settle for 45 minutes. Anything beyond that diminishing returns, we don't need to. Um, Rick just mentioned, my mind turns to those K to three teachers, maybe mostly K to one in the YouTube dance breaks, the businesses that have entire office breaks for quick stretch and activity by their desks. Yeah, and so we can do things like um, 20 seconds of shadow boxing, stand up and drop into warrior pose, uh, running on the spot, push-ups against your desk, stretching in any way at all, like literally everything works. I love those schools that while the weather is um, permitting, get the children outside and go for a walk around the school before you start the day. There was another school that I worked with, which was really interesting. What they did um, was during, it was a high school and during exam times, when the students were in the gymnasium writing exams, they opened up the back doors and you could go outside, walk around the track and come back in. Obviously, they were careful you couldn't communicate and all those sorts of things, but that was a way for them just to dissipate the stress. If you needed to go for a quick walk at any point during the exam, there's a track. Go ahead. So if we're creative and if we open up the possibility for doing things differently, I think that we can incorporate this into our schools and actually have better academic outcomes as a result. I know it feels like we're losing time in the classroom, but I believe that we get that time back exponentially if we lean into some of these ideas. Research is becoming a little bit more defined now in that we are learning what types of physical activity affect different types of cognition. 
And what we're settling on is the fact that exercise seems to improve concentration, alertness, learning, problem solving, creativity, and agile thinking. So we really want to try to, if we possibly can, move to spark learning. We also want to make sure that we're moving in order to spark our mental health. Mental health has been extraordinarily problematic for the last few years. Actually, it was problematic before the pandemic. It's become you know, significantly more challenging uh, during the pandemic. And now we're facing increased levels of burnout as depression and anxiety begin to decrease. But ultimately, what we also know is that physical activity improves mental health outcomes. This is some very interesting data that was published a few years ago that shows that if we get three, four, or five exercise sessions per week, we have the lowest risk for mental health burden, which is depression and anxiety, mild to moderate mental health challenges. So three, four, or five exercise sessions a week, best mental health outcomes. This data goes on to show that it doesn't matter what you do, it's all roughly the same pattern. Walk, run, jog, swim, bike, paddle, lift weights, it's all the same, it all works, as does gardening, housework, any type of movement counts. These data suggest that 45 minutes seems to be the optimal duration for these types of activities. So if you want to think about three times a week, 45 minutes as being our minimum standard for good mental health, that's fantastic. That can be in school. That can be include playing on the weekends for you, listening, not necessarily thinking about like class or anything like that. Maybe that's a walk on Saturday, a bike ride on Sunday, and one workout during the week, and you win. That will protect your mental health throughout the course of the year as well. So our idea there, the power up, is three to five times 45. That's really what we're looking for here. That gets you fantastic returns on your physical health, but also exponential benefits when it comes to your mental health. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be absolutely anything. Walking at a super slow pace is just as good for your mental health as getting out for a hard run. So whatever works for you, go with it, leverage that, and make sure it's fun, right? This is my daughter, Ingrid, a few years ago. And um, she and I have always gone off and done. She's like, you have to announce me. And I'm like, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Ingrid Wells is about to climb Mount Everest. And she poses. So she's got confidence issues. If you've seen me speak before, I've probably shown you, shown you this video. Um, I love, by the way, activities that have an element of risk associated with them. Not that I want my kids to get injured or hurt or anything. But when done safely, there is, you know, this element of, of fear and overcoming that and failure and overcoming that. I love it when my kids fail. I know that sounds a little bit strange, but that's how they learn. And uh, the fact that a few years ago, there was some pushback against allowing kids to fail in schools boggles my mind, but um, it's so important. But anyway, she gets to the bottom here and I want you to look at her face right here. Happy, confident, proud, energized, right? Like this is just an incredible psychological state for her to be in. So when it comes to physical activity, when it comes to stuff that we do in our schools, for, for you at home, for you when you're at work and at school, I just want us to pick stuff that's fun. Do things that you enjoy. If you like going for a walk, great. If you like gardening, fabulous. If you like doing CrossFit, go for it. If you like mountain biking, awesome. Hiking, sleds, like whatever it happens to be go for it because it all works. It's all fantastic. And if you enjoy it, there's a very good chance you'll do more of it and get those benefits when it comes to your mental health. So I'm going to pause there. And first of all, I would just invite questions, anything at all about physical health, well-being, when it comes to physical activity, incorporating that into our lives, feel free to use the Q&A, feel free to use the webinar chat. And I have a little ask for you that I would like to dedicate the next four minutes to when it comes to your physical activity. I would love for you just to think and maybe jot down some notes, maybe talk to the person next to you. How could you do the three to five times 45? How could you sprinkle physical activity throughout the course of your day? Is there anything that you could add, or if you're crushing it, that's fabulous, just go with it. 
But all we're looking to think about right now is, is there anything that you could do systematically as a routine, as a practice, as a ritual this year to increase your physical activity levels generally during the course of the day? And then how could you accomplish the three to five times 45? Are there three windows during the week of time when you might be able to get out for a walk, go for a bike ride, do some climbing, whatever it happens to be that you love to do, what makes you happy, what is fun for you. And if you could just take maybe three minutes and we'll, we'll contemplate that this and come back um, at 11.35. So sorry, it's 11.35 my time, 9.35. So let's just take three minutes. Have the conversation with the person next to you. There's no one there. Jot your notes down. If you want to just make some notes on your own, that's totally cool. But let's try to tackle those specific things. How can you accomplish the three to five times 45 over the course of the week? Two, how do you increase and sprinkle physical activity throughout the course of your day in as little as 20 second blocks, like that 20 seconds of shadow boxing, right? All right, I'll give you that time right now. Go for it. And I will get Ingrid up on the slide here just to get you a little bit of inspiration there. And I will just sort of monitor the chat, monitor the Q&A to see if anyone has any questions. But I'll just give you a couple minutes. Just think about that and contemplate where we can go with this. Just go one more minute, everyone. <clears throat> All right, bringing it back in. You guys are amazing. You're doing fantastic. Super thrilled that you are, um, you know, doing this work, doing this thinking, doing this learning. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Really proud of you. And the, got it. A um, couple questions came in and I'd want to just sort of highlight them because they're really important and very, very helpful. Um, the comment was, I find I do better when I include others. So do a long walk with friends once a week. I do squash, drop in once a week, go to the tennis club once a week. And of course, walk my dog gets me to an average of 12,000, wow, 500 steps per day. Accompaniment really seems to help me. That is so great. What we want to try to do here is to make success inevitable. And when we have partners in crime, if you will, people that you go for your walk with, uh, people that you need to play squash, people that you go to the gym with, yoga class, whatever your community, that makes it really easy to go on days when maybe you don't totally feel like it, right? Like you're at your desk, you're getting some marking done and someone walks by and like, hey, Greg, it's time to go for our walk. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm really busy. Just need to get these things done. And they're like, hey, Greg, it's time for our walk. We're going for our walk now because that's what you committed to. Let's go. I'm like, oh, all right, I cannot stand to be asked the same question three times. Um, if you recognize that movie reference. But that gets me out. And I also know that when I, and as a competitive swimmer growing up, I, I you know, I swam at University of Calgary. Um, I also know that when I am in swim practice, I train 
really a lot harder than I do when I'm by myself. And I finish the workouts, I go longer distances. So I know that I love being with people as I work out. Now, solitude is a great option too. Some people love running on their own. My wife loves running on her own with music. She does not like training in a group when it comes to running. And so we want to leverage the power of solitude, sometimes fantastic. And we want to think of solitude, though, as a choice. Isolation is solitude without a choice. So uh, make sure we're like deliberately choosing that if you want to go. But yeah, build your dream team, make that happen. Um, yeah, so those are really good. Peter got the Austin Powers reference. Good for you. That's awesome. A uh, couple more questions have just come in and there's someone who's raised their hand. So I will uh, actually, you know what, Carrie, I'm going to see if you want to just um, have a, have a, have a chat there and I'm going to let you speak or, or Carrie, if you could just use the chat, if you will, please and just drop your question into the chat. That's probably the best um, from Jeff. What role does diet pursuing more lean mass have? mass on your having have on neurological functioning and learning etc there's quite a bit of information that's coming out now about learning um and let me just see if i can find that and cognition and you may have just jumped ahead into um where we're going with this in a little bit learning metacognition so that's healthy eating so um jeff i'm going to get there but it's in two sections from now that that question will will get answered um, and then one other question or comment from someone, I like to schedule expert instruction into my year plan. I've also, I've been most recently focused on canoe and river travel. Amazing. Learning really improves my desire to go out and participate in the activity. Oh my gosh, that is just so great and so powerful because what often happens is that as we get older, although we're involved in education and we help children learn, sometimes we stop learning ourselves. And we should be and can be lifelong learners. And one of the fantastic things that we can do is use physical activity and skill development. Oh, wait, hang on. Skill development. Where is it? There it is. Thank you for segueing me into the next section of my talk. Skill development can be done at any age. And skill development around physical activity builds up the brain to learn better, just like anything else that we do does as well. So I've been taking skiing lessons over the last few years, and that has been an amazing thing for my wife and I do. My daughter did it as well. She's way better than me. I'll never be able to ski as well as she does, but it's been a really cool skill to try to develop. So that's fantastic. Don't be afraid to go and get a lesson or two from a personal trainer on how to use weights. I had a principal once completely changed the trajectory of her life by starting to do dance lessons. And she did a dance for her entire school at the end of the school year. And it caused like, I'm almost in tears thinking about it because it was like the moment of her entire career, the whole school was cheering for her. Right. So um, just an amazing thing for us to um, get into pickleball from Ron. Thank you. Oh my gosh. An entirely new sport. The whole world is doing it. Everyone loves it. And it's so much more accessible. Love that one. Um, from Another comment here. Most of my exercise happens after four o'clock. Walk my dogs nearly every day. Great dogs are awesome for getting you out of the house. And then a question, I guess, where can I find smaller activities or ideas to incorporate into English class where, like you said, time is so valuable? Generally give my kids a small break for 10 minutes, but I'd love to do an activity with them instead of just going on their phones, looking for activities that teenagers won't groan at. You know, it's funny. The first time that you do it, they will groan. The second time, a few of them will groan. The third time they begin to feel it. And the fourth time they'll be asking you for it. So I had a group of kids at University of Toronto schools in Toronto. Their math classes were 90 minutes long. I did a speech like this one for them. And they begged their math teacher, hey, can we do five minutes in the middle of math to do a stretch break? And they got into it. And although doom scrolling feels good because it's relaxing. You're not consciously thinking. And it is sort of like a, a dopamine hit that everyone's addicted to right now. I believe that doing some sort of physical activity can be anything. It can be a yoga pose. It can be um, mirror work where you move. The other person's got to follow you. They're like, there's so many different quick 10, five minute games that you can do. 
Um, but I will look some of those up, flip them to Rick and see if he can send them out to you. But I really like that, that idea, which is just, just awesome. Um, yeah, got it. So another question is, well, this may come as a question for later, but any advice how to get school jurisdictions to buy in the data about benefits of PA and cognition has been out for a long time. Spark came out in 2010, what else do we need to do? Yes, basically it comes down to this. We can control what we can control and we do our best around the stuff that we can't control. So I'm having these conversations like we're having today with people in the federal government. I've been having conversations with people in provincial governments across the country, in other countries, in the UK and Australia. That's really been what I've been doing non-stop for the last 12 years is trying to get this into more schools and while we have had some progress and some boards have been progressive change at a systemic level is difficult and what i have defaulted to is just simply helping teachers sprinkle physical activity throughout the course of the day in their classrooms because it's easy it's fast it helps it works doesn't cost anything and so that's where I have landed and why this interaction with hundreds of you has been so exciting for me and so possible. The other thing I have discovered is that once many teachers are doing this in classrooms, not everyone, but you get more and more and more, then all of a sudden it's easy for VPs and principals to then take it to directors and superintendents. It's easy then for superintendents to take it up to the Ministry of Education. And so I've been doing it that way. You know, one handshake at a time, creating a movement from the from the ground up. Um, and so that's what I've defaulted to because I tried to do it, you know, top down through the government and didn't really get anywhere. Uh, and so now I'm just doing it systematically and hopefully um, giving teachers the information that they need and the confidence to just do this every day as part of their day, their week, their month, their year. So I hope that that's that that's helpful. Um, I think I've answered all the questions on that. Let's move into skill development and learning. This is also super important. By the way, skill development could be athletic, musical, drama, creative writing, mathematics, everything to do with, um, with school and all those sorts of things. Uh, Rick just posted, um, if everyone wants to check it out, in the class, um, sorry, in the chat, classroom PA ideas. Rick, thank you. You got my back. Great job. So here's a really interesting thing about physical um, skill development and learning. It doesn't happen during the course of the day. It happens at night while we sleep. If we sleep well, we learn better. We encode learning from the day into our brains at night while we sleep. Allow me to explain. So every single night while we sleep, the 100 billion neurons that we have inside the brain, they look like this at the microscopic level, shrink, and all the space opens up inside the brain. And a clear fluid called cerebral spinal fluid washes through the brain every single night while we sleep. That's called the gliolymphatic system or the glymphatic system. There's an incredible TED talk by Jeff Illiff who highlighted this a number of years ago. And we've now learned that at night while we sleep, the brain repairs, recovers, and regenerates. That lymphatic picks up viruses, bacteria, broken down cells, waste products, and pulls that up to the inside of our skull, where a network of lymphatic vessels connects to the lymphatic system in the body that I explained earlier, and drains out into the body every single night while we sleep. So this is how the brain cleans itself out, heals, repairs, recovers, and regenerates. But getting into the learning side of things, we've also discovered that there are five different types of sleep. We're in stage one, two, three, four. We cycle through these stages of sleep throughout the course of the night in roughly 90 minute increments. And we need, as adults, five complete sleep cycles to have the lowest risk of all cause mortality. That's ballpark seven to eight hours, you know, probably around seven and a half, but a little bit less, a little bit more, no big deal. Um, there will be natural variations in that. The younger that you are, the more sleep that you need. We add sleep cycles. So for example, teenagers need an extra sleep cycle, grade school, one extra sleep, sleep, um, one extra sleep cycle, preschoolers, one extra, right? All the way down to the point of when children are just born, they might sleep up to 20 hours a day. The cool thing is, is that we actually learn while we sleep 
in the first three sleep cycles, the first four and a half hours of sleep, when we are in deep sleep, the brain is washing itself out, the neurons have shrunk. And it is at those moments when new connections between neurons inside the brain are created. That is when the motor pathways, where we encode this motor skill learning from the day, how do I throw a ball, that gets coordinated into the brain, embedded into the brain at night when we sleep, not during the course of the day. I said that at a school in Ottawa once. I was like, you guys don't learn anything when you're here. And they're like, yes, we know. And I was like, no, it's not what I meant. I didn't like it when you sleep, right? And the other interesting thing about this, taking it one step further, is that although we learn in the first three sleep cycles when the brain is washing itself out, we set the stage for creativity and problem solving and imagination in the second half of sleep, which is why getting enough sleep is so critically important, especially if we're thinking about facilitating the arts, music, drama, creative writing, new solutions to old problems in math and science, getting enough sleep is the foundation for our ability to learn, to be creative, and to problem solve. We're also discovering that getting those required sleep cycles throughout our lifespan, especially from 10 years old and up, has an impact upon our mental health. And we know that sleep is related to both depression and anxiety. So if we're looking at ways to improve our mental health, sleep is a powerful tactic that we can use to help people perform better cognitively, but also to improve our mental health as well. Now we're learning that when we sleep, one of the interesting things that happens is that we can measure the quality of our sleep often using some wearable devices. And this is a way that I've been actually trying to get students to take, um, to get a better understanding of their own sleep levels such that they then begin to make changes like not using their devices as much at night. And on our devices, whether it's a wearable or a phone, you can now measure something called heart rate variability, which is how variable your heart rate is, obviously. And the more stressed that you are, the more your heart rate variability goes down, the less stress you are, the more your heart rate variability goes up. So in this case, you can see this is my heart rate throughout the course of a night. And you can see those peaks are increasing almost up to 100 milliseconds by the end of the night. What that indicates is a shift from sympathetic nervous system activation, which is my stress fight or flight system, which gets activated during the course of the day. I drive in traffic in Toronto. I, I teach, I speak, I do all sorts of things. I get activated, but then at night when I sleep, I want that system to calm down and shift to parasympathetic dominance such that I can digest my food, heal my muscles and repair my brain. And that's evidenced by this increase in heart rate variability over the course of the night. You can easily get access to this too, just by waking up and taking your heart rate for, for 60 seconds um, after you've woken up before you, before you sit up in bed, track that over time decreasing resting heart rate is a good thing. Increasing resting heart rate is, is, is maybe indicating um, higher levels of stress and heart rate is different than heart rate variability. So they're the opposite. Um, I can explain that to you and I've got an article on it if anyone wants to um, check that out. Uh, Dallas asks, oh, would this be the same for people who need sleep meds or with sleep issues? It very much is. And so what we're looking for in general for all of us is to access all five types of sleep, REM and one stage one, two, three, four. Now, while sleep meds may be prescribed to us for health challenges that we are facing, let's say you're going through chemo, you need sleep meds to fall asleep, take the sleep meds. I'm going through a difficult time at home with your relationships, can't sleep, sleep meds may help you get through that. Fantastic, take the sleep meds. What we want to try to do though, is to minimize the amount of time that we are on sleep meds, shorten that as much as possible, use that as a bridge to creating good sleep hygiene and tactics, which I'll explain in a moment, because we know that long-term use of sleep medications increases your risk for all-cause mortality and shortens lifespan. So they are a short-term bridge to better sleep 
tactics such that we can fall asleep and stay asleep without the use of sleep meds. Melatonin is slightly different. Melatonin is an exogenous hormone that we can take. Um, in general, that follows the same idea though. Use it as a bridge to develop those sleep habits, minimize the long-term use of melatonin because if we use melatonin for too long, we lose the ability to produce it ourselves, which then makes it difficult to fall asleep and to stay asleep. The only caveat to that is for kids on the spectrum for whom it is, uh, might be extremely beneficial. So we want to always couch everything I've just said against check this information with your healthcare professional so that you can um, adapt my ideas to your specific circumstances. Now, what we really want to also think about here is how do we build those great sleep um, habits, routines, and rituals such that you can fall asleep, stay asleep, so that you learn better and get that better skill development. And one of the most important things that we can do to make that happen these days is to avoid doing this and practice the digital sunset. And the reason why is if we consider the brain, you can zoom in, you can see it here, you can see the eyeballs there. This is an MRI scan sliced through the head at the level of the eyes. You're looking at it from above, there are the eyes. If we have these devices and we shine them into our eyes late at night, that light goes through the eyeball, hits the back of the eyeball right there, and a structure that converts light into electricity, which then shoots back through the optic nerve into the pineal gland that releases a hormone called melatonin. So when we are looking at our devices late at night, we are signaling electrically to the pineal gland. It's morning, it's noon, the sun just came up, and as a result, it makes it very difficult for the pineal gland to release melatonin. What we need to do is give the melatonin, sorry, give the pineal gland every chance we can to allow it to release melatonin naturally. So blackout blinds like I have here in my hotel room, going to bed at the same time every single night, getting away from using our devices in the hour before we want to be going to sleep. Here's some data from an Oura ring, which you can, um, which I use to track my sleep. My wife has actually appropriated it. She's now using it. Um, I've moved over to Apple Watch and I don't track my sleep all the time. Just check and, uh, my, my sleep levels every once in a while. But this is data that I got on a night rate when I worked up until the last possible second. And as you can see, I was repeatedly awake staring at the ceiling because I was just way too activated. The next night I did this. I took a moment, created an evening routine that allows me to dream, sleep awesome, connect with family, recover, regenerate. So the sleep, um, so the screens go off, do dinner with the family, hang out with Judith, dinner with Judith, Judith's my wife, just to be clear, 8 to 8.30 meditation, gratitude, journaling. Then we did the hot bath, cold shower thing, melatonin if I have been traveling, which helps me to reset after I've been jet lagged. Read for 20 minutes, fiction, not anything that's going to activate my brain, fall asleep by 9.30. And when I did this process, that was my sleep, completely different. And instead of being staring at the ceiling activated, I was calm, cool, and collected and fell asleep very, very quickly. So when we defend that last hour, give our brains a chance to decompress, to deactivate our physiology, that's what enables us to fall asleep and to stay asleep. So if we can build a protocol to do that, that's what will enable us to sleep better throughout the course of the year. And so one of the tactics that I have for you um, is to help you deal with this question. And this question, which is what the number one question I get when I do sessions, which is what do I do when I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't fall back to sleep again? I've got a tactic that I would love for all of us to do in it together. And it's called progressive relaxation. So let's just take a moment here, put down pencils and pens and just get settled in your, in your chair and whew, sit up straight, feet on the ground, arms on the ground. I'm gonna show you progressive relaxation. There's an incredible tool you can use to fall asleep. There's an incredible tool that you can use to reset your class if they're fidgety. This is also a really good tool that you can use to fall asleep if you've woken up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep again. So it goes like this. We're just setting ourselves up. Just let's take a nice breath together. And a long exhale. Let's just do one more. 
and a long exhale. I'd like you to bring your attention to your body and your body sensation and position. Bring attention into your hands. I'm just like you to make fists. Feel that tension. Deep breath in. And just let them go. Same thing with your feet. Tighten up your toes. Deep breath in. And exhale. Notice the difference between tension and relaxation. Let's try it one more time. Tighten up those toes. Deep breath in and eight seconds out. Notice your feet are almost tingly at this point. Point your toes and tighten up your calves. Three, two, one. Deep breath in and relax. Pull your toes up this time, tighten up your shins. Three, two, one, deep breath in and let it go. Notice the difference between tension and the heaviness of relaxation. Let's let those feet sink into the floor. Pull your heels back into the legs of your chair or into the ground, tighten up your hamstrings, backs of your legs. Deep breath in, just let them go. quadriceps now, your thighs, let's tighten those up. Don't kick the person in front of you. <laughs> Deep breath in. And just let that go and relax. Abs, stomach, tighten up those ab muscles. Get that six pack back. Deep breath in. Just relax your belly like a baby. Deep breath in through the ribs. Notice the tension through the rib cage and let go. Let's contract our forearms and fists again. Deep breath in and a shake loose those hands. Let's do the arms and shoulders. Just let those relax. Let's just do a body scan from your head. Just relax your scalp. Relax your face. Relax your shoulders. Arms. Chest. legs, and feet. Hopefully you feel a little bit better now. I know I do. Progressive relaxation helps us to decrease our tension level, bring our attention into the present moment, calm down the mind and body to enable you to fall asleep and to stay asleep. It's a very cool, interesting, fun tool that you can use. And I teach this to kids all the time as a core practice for the athletes that I work with. And it, people have found this very, very helpful. Now, the next task that I have for you in the next four minutes is the last hour protocol. I would love for you to think about what are three things that you can do in the last hour before you fall asleep that will enable you to deactivate your psychology and physiology so you can fall asleep and you can stay asleep. 
we call this the 202020 protocol. 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes on three things that help you to decompress. There's actually this little worksheet here. So we think two hours out, what do I want to be doing? In general, for us, that's electronics off. 60 minutes before sleep, what do you want to be doing? For me, usually that's like bath, shower, right? Just taking a moment to decompress. 40 minutes before sleep, that's my meditation time. 20 minutes before sleep, that's either journaling or reading fiction, then lights out. When I follow that protocol, I sleep fantastic. When I deviate from this protocol, it does not go super well. So I'd love for you to take the next three minutes from 12.02 to 12.05 and just jot down some notes about what are some things that you might do to move you through this 20-20-20 protocol to help you to fall asleep and to stay asleep. If you want to write them down, that's great. Chat to the person next to you if you've got someone that you um, trust that you work with that you like. And um, let's take three minutes to do that. I'm just going to go get some water. I'll be right back. But uh, three minutes on the 2020 protocol or anything that you can do to defend your last hour so that this year you sleep well, you feel better, you recover and regenerate more. Three minutes, go. I will be back with water. All right, here we go. Let's give you all one more minute. All right, let's all just stand up. So if you're sitting, um, it's been an hour, so I need you to spark your brain. So if you could all just sort of join me, oh, just stand up, shake loose a little bit, shake loose those legs, shake loose those arms. Don't be afraid to do a couple twists just to loosen up your spine a little bit. Take those deep breaths. Oh, shake loose those hands and you rotate your head a little bit. Bend those legs, crack, crack those knees if you need to, like I just did. And keep the learning going by being a little physically active, bounce up. All right, cool. Let's rock. Here we go. Got to do everything I can to keep your attention via your screens. Let's dig into learning and, and metacognition a little bit. There's some information that's come out that I just love to share um, that I think will really help you a great deal this year and has everything to do with justifying taking the time necessary, like we just did there, to dissipate tension, calm down, and relax a little bit. Because when we do that, when we get out of beta brainwave stress state down into an alpha brainwave state, when we can learn 
and reflect, that's what opens up our ability to absorb information. We cannot absorb information or learn or reflect or think strategically or plan when we're stressed. This only happens once we have rested and brought ourselves down in terms of our activation level by about 50%. Alpha brain waves are detected in the frontal lobe of the brain right behind your forehead. So think about someone who's thinking deeply about a subject. What do they often do? They are rubbing their forehead, right? Like, oh my gosh, that's a good question. Think about that. Because you can actually feel that occurring right here behind the forehead. Now, the way for us to enter into an alpha brainwave state so that we can learn better is to do a body practice, a mind practice, and an environmental practice. And the first one is to get the body calm. When we're doing focused execution, when we are sparking the brain to bring it to life, physical activity helps, which is what we just did. We stood up, we shook, shook our arms out, you know, we moved our bodies a little bit, but then we sat down to do the actual absorbing of information. The bonus is that children do this naturally. This is my son, Adam, demonstrating strategic thinking on the beach. And what he is doing is leveraging the fact that stillness is a superpower. And I don't mean isolation. I don't mean loneliness, I mean stillness. And if you think about someone who's reading a book, for example, like what are they doing? They're often sitting, reading their book and they are frozen, except to flip a page, they don't move. And that's how they're absorbing the information. So by alternating periods of intense activity with periods of stillness, we can keep learning going on an ongoing basis because we're dissipating tension and then dropping into alpha, dissipate that tension, drop into alpha. And you can repeat that throughout the course of the day. The second factor is that we want the mind to be reflective. Research shows in education that when students ask three questions before beginning to study for an exam, the three questions are, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And how am I going to get it done? What, why, and how? that their performance increases on subsequent tests by about three to 5%. Transparently, I had an experience about this 10 years ago. That's me in the hospital, with the cardiac ward in Toronto General. My daughter, Ingrid, got viral. Um, she picked up a cold. I got the cold. Instead of just getting better like she did, I ended up with viral myocarditis. Hospitalized in Toronto General, where I worked at the time. Super embarrassing. And when I was in the hospital, I asked myself, what do I want? get out of here and never come back again um, as a patient. Don't mind being there as a researcher, not interested in being there as a patient. Why? Because I have a young family at the time. I want to make sure that I'm around for them. And how am I going to get this done? Well, obviously I'm in, a, I'm in the cardiac ward. I should register for Ironman. So I pulled out my computer, registered for Ironman. The fact that I had my computer with me in the cardiac ward without question why I was in the cardiac ward in the first place, no doubt. But ultimately what that led to, that getting into a reflective state of sitting still for a couple of days and contemplating what was going on, that's what opened up the possibility of making this fundamental shift, registering for Ironman, beginning to train for Ironman, doing some workouts. That enabled me to go from Greg on the left to Greg on the right. And I don't show you this to be like, hey, look how great Greg is, because an 80-year-old lady blew by me at the finish line, not the greatest athletic accomplishment of my career, but I only show this to you to highlight the different look on my face, right? Greg on the left, not in a good place. Greg on the right, pretty solid, pretty happy. And that happened because once I entered into an alpha brainwave state, I got out of stress mode because it was a crazy time in my life, commentating the Olympics in London, launching my first book, Judah finishing grad school, moving houses. Ingrid was too, hadn't slept in two years, right? Crazy stress. Um, as a result, that's why I got super sick. The realization that I came to in that moment was that my priorities were out of whack. And my priorities were, Greg on the left, work, family, health. Greg on the right, health, family, work. That insight changed everything about the trajectory of my life at that time. So if you want to enter into this alpha state, by getting your mind to be reflective, the challenge is, is pausing to ask what, why, and how. This research that I've highlighted here at the bottom of this page shows that in educational environments, that improves subsequent performance by 3 to 5%. Not going to change the world, 
But if you do this consistently on a host of different things, can really get you those exponential results that lead to very different outcomes over time. Now, the final piece of the puzzle when it comes to getting people into an alpha brainwave state to spark learning is to leverage the power of nature. Now, you are in Alberta. It is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I've been to 53 countries, cycled across Africa, you know, jogged through deserts in India. Like I've been to amazing places. I'm not sure there's anywhere in the world that's as beautiful as Alberta with the mountains. That's in BC, but you get the point. You also have access to forests and beautiful grasslands. And the beautiful thing about getting out into these environments is that it improves your mental health. This is my daughter, Ingrid, early on in the pandemic, and she's not in a good place. Away from friends, activities canceled, not in school, right? Like all of those, all of those challenges that we were faced with. Um, I, you know, I'm a medical professional, respiratory physiologist. We did what we needed to do, but it, it took a toll. Uh, and one of the biggest tolls was our mental health, as evidenced by Ingrid here. Now, what I managed to do that day was to get her outside, and we went to the park, and I did nothing. I simply got her to walk around that environment. And this was her 10 minutes later. Happy, confident, and proud. Like, relaxed and calm. Just completely different headspace, a completely different psychological state. And I did nothing. <laughs> I just simply kept walking. And so when we get outside into nature, the cool thing is, is that we are exposed in our visual field to fractal patterns, which are repeating mathematical patterns that are present in 92% of plants. Now these patterns are present in plants and you can see them. They're amazing. What really blows me away though, is that these patterns that we see in nature, we also see in the body. This is a bush that I found recently on a hike. These are alveoli in our lungs. They're exactly the same mathematically. These are some branches I found last winter and they match exactly to the mathematical patterns of capillary beds in the heart. River systems match up with the mathematical patterns of neurons inside the brain. There is no separation mathematically between humans and our environment. We are nature, nature is us. We are part of all of this. And when we immerse ourselves in a beautiful natural environment that exists all across this incredible country, but especially in Alberta, we can gain some amazing, fantastic psychological benefits, specifically around getting us out of beta brainwave stress mode into an alpha brainwave state where we can learn. And obviously that's what it's all about. The other significant benefit of this is exposure to nature improves our immune system to such an extent that it, is even been, it has even been shown to increase the natural T killer cell activity, which can help us to fight off cancer cells, which is why I would love for you to think about for this year to spark learning, to maintain your mental and physical health, to practice some form of forest bathing, shinrin-yoku, nature medicine once a week, because the research shows that if you do this once a week, it carries the benefits for about seven days. Uh, someone recently asked me, Forest bathing. It was like, yes, yeah, forest bathing. Like, do I have to take my clothes off? Like, no, you can keep your clothes on. Let's not get arrested. Don't blame me for this. Um, that is that is all that we need to do. So try to figure this out. If you can get your class outside every once in a while, that's phenomenal. If you can get outside on the weekends, that's great. Morning walks, evening rides, play in the park. All of it counts. There's the blue workouts in the water, green workouts in the gym, right? Like or in the, in the parks. We're just looking to leverage the power of nature to get the mental benefits cognitively for our performance, but also the mental health benefits and of course the physical benefits as well. I hope that that is helpful. I'm just gonna monitor the chat here, see if there's anything else there is not. So I'm just going to keep rolling to make sure that I get to everything that I wanted to cover. One of the core elements of the curriculum is safety. And I did want to highlight this just for um, a moment. And 
the key element that I wanted to highlight here is, is I know that there's some violence in schools and I know that there's a difficult time. And I know there's significant challenges um, for teachers, especially and administrators. It is, it is a difficult time and I wanna recognize that and acknowledge that for sure. Um, there is some research that I think can be relevant for you to think about, especially for anyone who's in a leadership position. So this would be, you know, teachers and and their you know relative to students or VPs, you know, and principals and directors and superintendents. And the, and it all revolves around the concept of psychological safety, which is simply that we've got each other's backs. And I want to sort of think about that this year. Back in two thousand three, I had the opportunity after I finished my PhD. Uh, and no one would hire me, so I was unemployed, so I had five months off uh, to go ride my bike across Africa. And this is the, the route that we took. It was quite hot at certain points. Um, Ethiopia was incredibly challenging. Kenya, you know, began to become a little bit more beautiful, and but still, you know, extraordinarily difficult. And there was traffic in, in Kenya, in northern Kenya. This was the traffic jam that day. There was some mosquitoes in Malawi. Uh, but ultimately, we ended up getting all the way across the continent and uh, eight people on that expedition got into the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest human powered crossing of Africa, which I did not because I got hit by a cow in Malawi, long story. Um, but that really sparked my interest in high performance teams because what I noticed on that expedition with the 30 people that were traveling together was that it fractured, the group fractured and 10 people ended up in a certain headspace, another 10 people ended up in a certain headspace, and another 10 people ended up in a different headspace. My group was very focused just on going fast every day, but, um, and the, the group didn't work very well together. So I became interested in like, what is it that makes groups of people work well together? And a few years ago, I found the research by Google called Project Aristotle. And what Google did was they looked at almost 200 different teams within the organization, and they tried to figure out what was it about those teams that made some of them overperform and others underperform. The supplies in the classroom, the supplies in the school, the supplies in the school district, the supplies in companies, the supplies in families. And what they found was that how the team operated was more important than who was on the team because they would put the best engineer, the best UX designer, right, the best programmer all on the same team, and that wouldn't reliably predict the best outcomes. How the team operated determined the outcome. And they broke that down even further and discovered that there were five elements of, of, of high-performing teams. And item number two that I've highlighted here in orange is psychological safety. And I'm highlighting this one because it is part of your curriculum that Rick shared with me, and I wanted to celebrate that and highlight it for you because that is something that you've identified as important. And guess what? The research backs that up as being the most important contributor to people feeling safe. Breaking that down a little bit further, um, I just want to share with you the story of, of Saturday Night Live. And, and this show that has been on for decades has produced some of the most amazing comedians generation after generation after generation. And the reason why this show works is the way that they work, how they work. And what they do is on Monday through Thursday, the actors and the writers compete, throwing ideas out there to see what skits or characters are gonna make it onto the show on Saturday night. Thursday afternoon, the producers decide which ideas go forwards. And the actors and writers pivot from competing with each other to supporting each other. And that's hard because imagine you just had your idea rejected, then you gotta go support the person whose idea is moving forwards. And you got to do that over and over and over again. And so they work relentlessly on trying as hard as they can to make sure that the way that they work promotes psychological safety. And what has been found is that in a team with high psychological safety, teammates feel safe to take risks around the team members. They feel confident that no one on the team will embarrass or punish anyone else for admitting mistake, asking a question, or offering a new idea. It is psychologically safe. This is a very cool approach to promote in a classroom, just imagine a student throwing an idea out there and other people laughing at them, right? We've all had that happen to us. We wanna minimize that from happening so that we can create an environment where support always exceeds risk. We wanna have each other's backs. We wanna support each other. We wanna encourage each other. We want to celebrate each other. 
And that is very different than the world right now where social media is just driving people into echo chambers and people are losing the ability to communicate with each other. So I just really wanted to highlight that so we can come back together again and build our communities such that we are healthy, we are safe, we have each other's backs and we are able to move forwards into this, this whole new era. All right, that's an idea that I wanted to share with you. And around this, I have a concept for you. And the concept is very simple. The concept is making sure that you have that psychological safety and that you have those people that are going to be supportive of you. And to make sure that this occurs for you this year, I would like for you to think about who are the five people personally and the five people professionally that you want to spend more time with. I'd like you to jot their names down and let's try to make sure that this year we allocate the time, effort, energy, and attention to make sure that we're spending time with those people. You don't need to see all 10 people every week, but it makes sense to try to touch base with one of those people in a deliberate, intentional way once a month. And that way, over the course of this year, you've spent time with the 10 most important people in your life in a deliberate way that will elevate you and them as well. So let's take two minutes right now. It's uh, 23 after. We'll start again at 25 after. And just take a moment. Just kick back and just ask yourself that question, right? Like, who are these people that elevate us? and who we ideally elevate as well. And let's just talk those people out. Five personal, five professional. Let's think about this because we wanna build our dream teams again. We wanna build that psychological safety for ourselves such that there is always more support than the risk. And of course there's risk moving forwards into the future, loads of uncertainty right now. Uh, and it's definitely time for us to make a move around that. So give you about 90 seconds here. Five people who elevate you personally, five people who elevate you professionally. Who are the people this year that you need to spend a little bit more time with? I'll give you about another minute just to jot some of those ideas down. Just a few more seconds here. All right. You guys are doing so well. We are almost there. Really proud of you. You're all doing absolutely fantastic. One of the other major areas, which is just so much fun, um, starting to turn off that so I don't get distracted. Uh, one of the other areas which is so incredibly important for us is healthy eating. Now there was a question earlier which got asked, which um, I have already deleted and, and moved on from, but it was basically around, is there any evidence around food for the brain? And there absolutely is. We now are learning so much about the fact that our brains respond to the foods that we eat. In fact, we think about the brain, it's a, it's a, this is a slice through the head. You're looking at it from the side, another MRI scan. No, was, no one was injured in the creation of this image. But imagine taking a camera and zooming into the tissues up top. There are those 100 billion neurons, each with thousands of connections. And it is at those connections where thinking takes place. And the way that that works is little molecules called neurotransmitters move back and forth between the ends of those neurons. And that's what carries the signals back and forth 
between different regions of the brain, which creates the thoughts, the emotions, the mathematics, the music, the drama, the sports, all of it happens right at these neurological junctions. And what has been discovered is that the foods that we eat influence the type of neurotransmitters that are created inside the brain to such an extent that there is now a field called nutritional psychiatry, where we are learning about which foods impact our mental health and which foods can be used to treat mental health challenges. But ultimately it comes down to, when we look at those types of foods, broadly speaking, like we know what they are. We're talking about healthy proteins. We know that when we eat foods that are higher in protein than carbohydrate, we narrow our focus and concentration. When we have foods that are higher in carbohydrate than protein, we widen our focus and relax. It's one of the reasons why I feel that it is so critically important for us to get rid of processed foods out of our schools and to make investments in terms of time, energy, and attention to increasing the quality of, of food that's available in and around the schools in our country. The reason why getting weight rid of processed food is so critically important is because they tend to be high in sugars. And we know that high sugar diets and um, high processed food diets result in a decreased size of the hippocampus, the region of the brain that I've highlighted here in red. The hippocampus is responsible for learning and the creation of memories. And we know that high sugar, high processed food diets result in a decreased size of the hippocampus, lower cyclic AMP, the energy currency inside brain cells, lower BDNF brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and lower synaptin mRNA, the genetic code for new neural connections inside the brain, which is how we actually physically create memories and encode learning. Now, if we want to go the other direction and actually increase the ability of the brain to function well, to protect the brain, to heal the brain, to optimize the brain, believe it or not, we're actually looking at increasing healthy fats. So that's cold water, fatty fish, avocado, nut butter, coconut, olive oil, all are incredible options because healthy fats are what's used to create brain tissue. That's the picture of the surface of the brain, the white parts of the brain tissue itself. The reason why it's white is because it contains fats, very specifically omega-3 fatty acids that are used to create myelin, which wraps around the branches of your neurons, just like bark on the branch of a tree. So we have enough healthy fats in our diet, myelin gets created, nerves get protected, and the brain functions better. Now, it's really interesting in our world right now that we know this information, we know how important it is, but it's very, very difficult for us to create an environment that makes healthy nutrition easy. That was highlighted on an expedition that I did to India a few years ago with a group called Impossible It's Possible. We take children on expeditions around the world, they do um, marathons and hikes in different locations around the planet. We broadcast to uh, thousands of students around the world. The, the group's called Impossible to Possible. Um, I'll just type that in the chat if you want to check it out. We provide free educational resources to teachers to be used inside the classroom. So check that out. It's impossible to possible.com. And that's with Ray Zahab, my buddy. Uh, and on this particular expedition, while the, the youth ambassadors were out doing their five marathons on five consecutive days through the Thar Desert in the northwest corner of India, we were running and bouncing into and bumping into, excuse me, meeting, you know, kids from all sorts of different locations and a couple different cultures up there. Absolutely amazing, stunningly beautiful. And one of the days I went into one of the villages and I found this gentleman selling all of the traditional Indian foods. And you'll notice all of the colors of the rainbow are there. White, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, all there. There's anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, anti-types, diabetes, anti-metabolic syndrome, anti-depression. I took this photo and I turned my body 90 degrees and I took that photo. And unfortunately, as these diseases, or sorry, as these foods are making their way into India, Brazil, Malaysia, Kenya, our schools, our businesses, um, in some cases our homes, the diseases of the West are following cancer, heart disease, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome. And so, although I don't think there's any bad foods out there, like all that I'm suggesting here 
is that we can nudge ourselves in a direction of a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that. I'm not saying we can't have treats, can't have chips, can't have ice cream or anything like that. Like, absolutely, no big deal. But what we wanna to try to do is just in general, on average, nudge ourselves in a direction of a little bit more of the foods that make us feel good, make us feel happy, make us feel healthy. Those that give us more energy, right? Just a little bit of stuff like more spices, a little bit less sauces. And what this does in following this idea of health is equal to nutrients over calories, all we're trying to do is just bump up the number of nutrients that we are getting. The cool thing that that does is it lowers inflammation and oxidation inside the body. It's another way of sort of saying aging. Uh, and so whenever we are stressed mentally or performing physical work, as we sometimes do, metabolically at the cellular level, it's kind of like a fire is burning inside of our tissues. And that causes mechanical stress and physical stress and ultimately structural damage. So if you do weights, for example, you're sore, your muscles are sore. If you have a hard day at work where you're thinking a lot, managing a lot of stuff that's going on, you get home and you have brain fog, your brain is tired. If we then rest, recover and regenerate, the body heals. So in those moments of stress, it's almost like a forest fire has burned through your brain tissue and your body tissue. If we then allow that stress to trigger the inflammatory process, the oxidative process, that releases all sorts of healing molecules out into the body and the body begins to regrow, just like occurs after um, a forest fire. That leads to something called adaptation. Your muscles get stronger, your brain becomes more resilient and your tissues regrow. The key way to make this happen, the key way for us to manage and deal with this and to navigate this moving forward in an era of relentless stress, chronic stress, is just to follow this simple idea from Brad Stolberg and, and Steve Magnus that they popularized in their book, which is that stress plus rest equals growth. And what we're often missing in this equation is the rest part. Give yourself permission to get a good night's sleep. Give yourself permission to get some great food go for the walk, turn off the phone, take the break, have the dinner with your friends and family, do the meditation, right? Whatever it is that you use to recharge yourself in a healthy way, that is so critical for us to get onto this growth pathway and heal, repair, and regenerate our minds and our bodies. When it comes to nutrition, simple practice around this, it's to leverage the power of eating a rainbow of colors from fruits and veggies, not vegetarian, you can do that if you want. All that I'm suggesting is that when we have multiple different colors of fruits and veggies in our diet, we get the phytonutrients, polyphenols, flavonoids, and carotenoids that help us to prevent chronic disease. And I want you to live a long time. I want you to feel amazing. I want you to have lots of different, lots of energy. And eating the rainbow is a cool, simple practice that you can use on average over the course of the day, the week, month, the year to get to that place where your body has exactly what it needs. Another way of getting more antioxidant compounds into our body to heal, recover, and regenerate our tissues is to leverage the power of things like green tea. You're going to like this one, chocolate, <laughs> dark chocolate, 70% cocoa and above, loads of polyphenols and flavonoids that are great for your blood vessels. Berries appear to be spectacular for your brain and powerfully antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Really good option for snacks. Nuts are also really good. No, you can't have them in school, but they're fantastic for your brain. Loads of fiber, also great options for you. Some of the example recipes that I've been using for the last few years, we do a lot of this first thing in the morning to get hydrated. Ginger has anti-pain properties. Fantastic. Lemon just makes it taste good. We've been doing loads of smoothies in my house recently just to try to get good nutrition on board with the kids. Easy, fast. You can have it in the car on the way to school. Um, after workout, while studying. We do a lot of this, overnight oats as well, like make these on Sunday night, stick them in the fridge. They last for up to four days. This is grab and go before and after practices. And then the philosophy of healthy eating that's great for the brain, for you watching this here today, people with cognitively demanding jobs, 
is that what we're looking for when it comes to healthier nutrition is simply to make sure that there are a few different elements as part of what we're doing. A few different elements are veggies, protein, healthy fat. That's it because the veggies give you those polyphenols and flavonoids. Protein is what your brain needs to concentrate and focus. Healthy fats pr protect your brain. So we're approaching it purely from a cognitive perspective. That is what we're looking for. You can see that here. Another example, same thing, protein, veggies, healthy fats, phenomenal, fantastic. Carbohydrates are great. If you're doing any sort of physical activity whatsoever, just try to choose ones that are higher in fiber than sugars and you win. Um, all of those recipes that I've just shown you are from these two cookbooks. So if you wanted to check those out, they're a great way to, to get started around all of this. When we're talking about nutrition, one other simple, healthy, uh, simple idea around making it easier for you to build this into your life is to leverage having a plan. Quite often when it comes to nutrition, like we shoot arrows and then walk over and draw bullseyes. <laughs> what I would love for you to do is to draw some bullseyes and then load up the arrows, which simply means bring some snacks, bring some healthy food with you. We try to get things on the go when we're tired, when we're stressed, we tend to make uh, decisions that maybe aren't the best for us long-term. And again, I don't, there's no good or bad decisions when it comes to nutrition. We're just trying to nudge ourselves in one direction or another and just like little micro improvements win here and there. Micro improvements, like simple, easy things to do or basic, like just have a little bit more water. That in and of itself, as I'm trying to do here at this stage of, of the talk, you know, almost two hours in, so my voice is going a little bit, is super powerful too, because water gives us more energy. Remembering the Krebs cycle from grade 10, all the science teachers like, woo! -hoo. But basically what happens in our Krebs cycle inside of our mitochondria is when we break down the foods that we eat for energy, you need water in order to make the Krebs cycle work. Water and oxygen, we breathe, we drink water, that gives us more energy. So throughout the day, staying hydrated is a super easy, powerful way for you to elevate that health status that you are in to have more energy. It doesn't need to be just water. It can be herbal tea. That works great too. We're just looking for drinks with no more than zero calories, um, you know, water with fruit juice, herbal tea, all absolutely spectacular options for you. And I'm encouraging people now to get like one to two liters of water a day. I know that might seem like it's a lot, but that's what we need in order to stay hydrated over the long term. So in the resources that I'm going to share with you later on, we have an Eat Smarter workbook with loads of examples and plans and meals and ideas for you that you can track and share and try out and let me know. And if you need other ideas, let me know because I've got some really cool people on my team that can pull together um, lots of different ideas for you. So perhaps I'll stop there, Rick, and just see if we have any questions about nutrition. Please feel free to drop those in. And I realize this can be a very difficult conversation for some people. So if you're not feeling this part of the talk, don't be afraid to just like turn the volume down and, and wait for me to move on to the last piece to, to wrap things up. But if anyone has any questions whatsoever about, about food, about nutrition, or anything on those on those lines, please let me know. I'd be super happy to um, lean into that. And I hope that I answered that question earlier. Um, someone has asked, will the slides be made available? Yeah, I will absolutely do this. I will give you the link where you can get all of the slides and this workbook and the app um, in a couple minutes when we wrap things up. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, I do not see any more questions. So why don't we move into the last section here and wrap things up. And I do wanna talk about healthy relationships a little bit. I know I talked about the dream team concept earlier and building those five people that you're gonna be spending more time with, but I know that this has been a huge issue. And between the COVID era, when we had to you know, practice social distancing um, and right now, when we are entering into echo chambers and polarization and, all of those sorts of grand challenges that we're faced with in our world, building healthy relationships is, um, is particularly challenging. But before I get into that, there was a really great question. Um, and I do want to address it before we move, before we move on. And the question relates to nutrition, the previous section, I just saw it come in and I, I want to address it because it's a powerful one. Um, the question is how do we promote nutrition in health class to prevent backlash from parents given the cost of food in Alberta? 
and this is true across the country. Um, we need to get creative and we need to have these conversations. We need to respect the fact that there are food deserts. We need to respect the fact that inflation is extraordinarily problematic and that eating healthy on a budget can be challenging, but it is not impossible. And one of the things that we have um, encouraged people to think about is that the variable that we can manipulate to some extent is time. So for example, batch cooking protein is an op option. We in my family do batch cooking of protein Sunday night and Wednesday night. It just speeds everything up and that we were not buying things on the go. We have done things like move, we got rid of cable and allocated that money over to our food budget. I know that's, I've come from infinite privilege to be able to even have this conversation, but that's one of the tactics that we, that we use in my family. Spices are cheap, sauces are expensive, rice is cheap, beans are cheap, lentils, legumes are cheap, veggies are cheap. So we want to find ways of making healthy food ourselves because that is what will enable us to keep the budget under control. And there's no question, it's extraordinarily difficult to do this. I have a partner, we have a family, very easy for us because we can tag team to some extent. It's extraordinarily difficult for a single parent. It's extraordinarily difficult for people on a, on a single income, double income. It's a hard time. And so we need to do our research and we need to come up with the recipes and the shopping lists to be able to eat healthy on a budget. It is possible. It can be done. It is going to take more time because we have to make the food ourselves. But ultimately when we do make the food ourselves, it's way better for us. And what we lose in terms of time up front, making the food, we gain back in time later on because we're not getting sick from all the different diseases that come from basically processed foods. So I believe it is possible to eat healthy on a budget. It is not easy, especially in terms of time, but I think being sick is not easy either. So we have to choose our heart on this one. And like I said, we've made some, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty massive changes in my family's budget to enable us to do this over the last few years. Because Judith and I were both unemployed for like 18 months during COVID. So we had to really shift gears to pull, the, pull this off. Uh, and so we really got creative around, around all of that stuff. Judith's a chiropractor and you know I'm a public speaker. So clearly that was a different world during COVID and we needed to make some adjustments. Super happy to share with you some resources. So at the end, when I share my information with you, if you want some more links to a couple really cool videos on that topic, feel free to, to contact me um, about that. I also think, yeah, Rick mentions, uh, we discussed that this might be a place where you could discuss finance management. Um, and actually this is why it's included in the health and wellness curriculum, because it is an issue, healthy eating, um, is a challenge and it has financial implications that are significant and really, really hard. So we need to help people with this. Hope that that's helpful. Thank you for bringing that up. That is super helpful. All right, wrapping things up. Last thing I'm saying to you, and then we will shut things down. is all about healthy relationships. And what I want to highlight here about healthy relationships right now is that there's a difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is stuff like the Beatles creating Abbey Road Studios to go to a place where they would be not disturbed such that they can do what they do at the highest possible level. Isolation is you're alone and it's not your choice and that can have negative impacts. In fact, we've seen some really interesting research that shows that solitude alone by choice enhances creativity and imagination, enables self-reflection and growth, and reduces mental health challenges. So I would love for you to consider leveraging the power of solitude in this way. Is there a time during the week where you can find the space to be alone, to do what you need to do at the highest level related to what you care about the most? This could be reading a book, taking a course, making some food, listening to music, doing some carpentry, whatever that happens to be for you. 
Um, for me, it's being on the paddleboard in the morning on the lake so I can plan my day out, figure out what I need to do. That is my golden hour. That is my time that is so important to me because if I don't have that alone time to think about what I need to do during the day and it just runs straight into the inundation of what normally happens, I just don't feel um, like I'm in a good place. Isolation has negative effects and we really need to be careful about this and help people rebuild those social connections and facilitate those social connections such that we are in a place of health and well-being. There's very cool research that shows that when we compare various different factors and their impacts on our longevity, our mortality, that social connections are some of the strongest predictors of lifespan and health span. So much so that they are stronger predictors, social connections predict health span more accurately, predict lifespan more accurately than quitting smoking, than quitting drinking, than doing cardiac rehab after a heart attack, even more so than physical activity. I'm an exercise physiologist, kinesiology grad. Like, like I do not like these data because it shows I could have skipped my workout and gone for a beer with my friends and been better off. And I say that only as a joke, obviously, not seriously, but the data would kind of back it up to some extent in that when we are with the people that we love, that is what facilitates our mental, physical, and emotional health in addition to all of these other things. So please find your friends, find your communities, find you know pe people that you love, have the dinners, go for the walks, have the conversations, do the phone calls, send the text messages. Let's help our students do the same as well. And let's cultivate this love, compassion, and gratitude that we can have to move forward together into this school year to have a great year, despite the fact that, yes, the world is in a very challenging place right now where fear and uncertainty are, are prevailing. But I think that with love, compassion, and gratitude, we can actually move things forwards and go in a different direction. So my final thought to you is like the most important thing that we can do moving forwards from here is the idea of reconnecting with your dream team. Find the people in your life that you love, who love you. Let's spend a lot of time together with those people. So my new book, it's called Powerhouse, came out earlier this year in April. If you wanted to pick up a copy, I would be deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you so much for even considering it. I'm really happy with this one, really like it. It's doing awesome. So hopefully that helps you out. All of the ideas I've shared with you today have elements and work um, worksheets available in this workbook. I've got the PDF version for you. The app that I mentioned is called Video. Um, it enables you to track your sleep, your exercise, your nutrition, your mindset to get 1% tips. If you track nothing, you can still get the 1% tips. They're just a little bit less um, personalized for you. So if you could check that out, I would be fantastic. Um, deeply, deeply, deeply grateful because we've been working really hard on the app for the last five years. And um, we hope that that serves you well. All of those resources are available here at drgregwells.com forward slash um, ripple. No, sorry, wrong one. I have to change this. Just a sec. Recharge resources. There we go. My bad. So that's where these ones are. Check those out. They're there for you. And if you have any questions, don't use that QR code. Use that link. <laughs> Craig's adapting on the go. Sorry about that. Um, hope that that's helpful. Hope that those resources support you. Reach out through my website anytime. Just, hey, Greg, teacher from Alberta, got a question for you. I will absolutely get back to you. University of Calgary was so good to me. Um, so I will do anything in my power to support um, all of you. Rick just dropped that link in the chat for everybody. So really appreciate your time, everyone. Good luck this school year. Hope you do fantastic. Rick, thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody i will stop my screen share and flip it back over to you to wrap things up greetings from caesars hope that was helpful thank you very much greg take a drink of water i think you're you're on the verge of dehydration right now uh we do very much appreciate this and uh, folks what well, i'm i've been taking notes throughout and and gathering links in addition to sending out the link to the recording which will happen later today uh, we'll include a little package with some of the information to allow you to connect and leverage this work moving forward. Uh, much appreciation, Greg, and to thank you to those who have attended live and participated in the chat. 
And we know that there's uh, significant plans for others to access this uh, over the next couple of months. We definitely want to wish you all as you're just getting ready to start a 2023-24 school year. Wish you all the best for that. Uh, my thanks to uh, my colleagues across uh, the province and uh, as well, we'd like to thank those from Alberta Health uh, and Healthy Living who attended the session today. Um, we appreciate the partnership that we have with them and their uh, support inside the schools. So with that, we'll draw this to a conclusion and uh, I will stop the recording and we will bid you all all the best. Take care. Thanks, Rick. Take care.